Perfect. So thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you for having me. Um, as, as you've just heard, I'm Cathy Holloway. I'm the Academic Director of the Global Disability Innovation Hub. And I'm going to not really speak that much about artificial intelligence today, but more about the assistive technology uh, ecosystem and where and how I think AI can play a major role in helping to advance that. You've already heard many examples already, and I know that the panel discussions coming after me will flesh out what I'm saying even further. So I'm hoping just to um, just set the scene for the next panel. So very quickly, you might not know GDI Hub, we're a bit of an, we're a bit odd, really. We have um, an academic research centre. So in, in one part of my life, I am a professor of interaction design and innovation. And in the other part of my life, I work within the community interest company, which is a not-for-profit. It's like, instead of having a spin out of UCL, we're a bit of a spin into UCL. So we came out of the London 2012 Paralympics and we thought, how could we continue the legacy of London 2012? And we thought that if we brought everybody together uh, to work on disability innovation from, from a wide range of backgrounds, from AI experts through to transport experts, through to social scientists, teachers, and of course, with uh, disabled people, then we might be able to do something a bit better than, than had been happening previously. Um, and obviously we work with our partners and stakeholders. And one of the reasons I've been given three talks today is because a lot of partners and stakeholders are celebrating uh, the, the UN uh, Day for Persons with Disability, which of course we are today with We The 15. I just want to mention that within UCL, we house the WHO Collaborating Centre on Assistive Technology, and, and we're really open to working with people from, from anywhere to help accelerate assistive technology for a fairer world. And we also do that for our MSc in, in Disability Design and Innovation, and I spotted a couple of the students have, have joined, so that's great. We work across a wide range of things. We do research, some of my team are developing new products. We do innovation, which I'll talk about in a minute. We, we run big programs for, for the UK government, uh, for Asian Development Bank and, and others. We teach and we also advocate. And this today is, is part of our advocacy work, which obviously, as you can see, is in, in partnership with the Centre for Artificial Intelligence. And we work across a, a lot of areas. So a, a assistive and accessible technology or inclusive design of technology or, or the environment or inclusive educational technology, they might all seem, from what you've heard today, quite um, obvious. Um, maybe as well, cultural participation might seem very obvious, uh, having uh, had that wonderful panel discussion on autism and neurodiversity just now. And maybe the one that seems a bit odd is climate and crisis resilience. But the, the thing to remember about uh, disabled people is globally, so not, not thinking about the UK so much, but globally, most people with a disability or a disabled person lives in poverty. And if you're poor, you're more likely to be disabled. So if you've got a poor nation, that's mostly where the world's disabled population lives or in poor countries uh, with very little infrastructure. And those countries uh, are often most likely to be hit by the climate and crisis resilience. So it's very important that we bear in mind the sustainability of our planet, as well as the inclusion of everybody in it. So in setting the scene, I want to, you know, here's Mr. Peacock running very fast. He, he's much faster than I am. Uh, I, you know, on, on, a, on a track, he's obviously uh, less disabled than I am. Right? We then go to our first uh, global summit that we held as GDI Hub when we first started uh, back in 2017, I think we held this. And this is the first piece of artwork we commissioned, and it uses augmented reality to tell the story of local uh, disabled children about their disability. Um, and you can see a range of people interacting with that. It's a cultural event, and, and they're using technology to interact and, and learn about, about these stories. And then you see Abu, who's in Sierra Leone, um, and you see his environment is, is very different. Um, and this is the type of environment where an awful lot of our work is now taking place where the infrastructure or the footways we had, we heard some great uh, talks earlier about how, how AI is helping to make cities more accessible. It's very challenging when the infrastructure looks like this to then map uh, the, the AI onto something. And so we're, we're wondering how do, we, how do we advance a technology for the greater good of everybody? And so to put everything in context, a billion people at the moment need access to assistive technology. If you get assistive technology and assistive product, like eyeglasses, hearing aids, wheelchairs, a mobile phone that, that will speak to you, um, you'll probably need about three devices on average if, you, if you're a disabled person. So that's three billion devices um, and three billion sets of services that need to get to people. And 900 million people don't have access to any of that. 
Um, oftentimes when we give assistive technology to people, especially in low and middle income countries, it's not fit for purpose and, and breaks within months and then can't be repaired. However, we know that mobile in particular and Internet has bridged, has sort of bucked the trend of, of uh, um, technology adoption globally. And therefore, if we piggyback on that mobile, on the fact that electricity is now a bit more stable, on the fact that people are getting access to Internet, then AI offers a huge opportunity in this space to transform products, services and even policy. But there were also risks. There's huge risks of bias. There's risks of disabled people being left out of mainstream technology. So we need to acknowledge those as, as AI experts as, as we move forward. So to talk a little bit about assistive technology, what is it? You might think it's technology. Uh, that, like as a computer scientist, we think of a technology uh, like, say, a, a mobile phone. You might, might think it's that. But actually, the, the World Health Organization makes a very specific point about assistive technology being more than a product. Because if you just give somebody a product, but you don't train them in how to use it, and then you don't provide a repair service um, in order to repair it when it goes wrong, or enable to upgrade or downgrade their technology as their abilities either increase or decrease depending on their condition, then the product itself will be useless, either immediately or, or later. And this leads to huge abandonment rates um, across, across Europe, across America, and, and across the world. So on average, a third of assistive technology, assistive products are abandoned by users globally. So therefore, if assistive technology is the product and all of the infrastructure that helps to provide that product. The assistive product itself is any physical or digital advice which is external to the human body, whose primary purpose is to maintain or improve an individual's functioning and independence and thereby promote their well-being. So an assistive product is loads of stuff. Uh, some of them fall into health, some of them fall into education, some of them fall into mobility devices. And AI can power a huge number of different assistive products, but it can also power a huge number of the technologies in order to provide products. So an example might be a screening tool for hearing loss or a screening tool for eye loss, rather than having to go to an ophthalmologist, the technology might be loaded onto a mobile phone that comes to a local village to screen. So although it's not providing the eyeglasses, it's providing the information for the service to provide the eyeglasses. So as part of the AT2030 programme, which GDI Hub runs, it's a 20 million pound investment by UK government to test what works in getting assistive technology to people. We've produced a series of product narratives. So product narratives are worth a look. You go into the at2030.org forward slash publications website, and you'll see, for example, this one on digital assistive technology. And within here, you'll see what are the barriers, the systematic barriers to getting digital assistive technology to people. And what we find is when you look at digital assistive technologies, eyeglasses, hearing aids, all of the products, despite the fact that the cross-cutting nature of APs, they're predominantly understood when you look at the literature and when you begin to try and understand the world of assistive technology, purely through health and social perspectives. And sometimes this can hold back innovations. And from those perspectives, when you think about oh, assistive technology, that's all of the devices for people to, uh, who maybe can't walk to walk or for people who can't see to, to, to communicate. The problem is that that then looks like a coherent group of products. It's like they're health products. And, and, and so we know how to fund health products. But assistive products aren't a homogenous group. They're very diverse. Trying to look at all of the examples you've seen even today, trying to scale a business, for example, that is a digital platform that uses AI to screen for hearing loss. It's a very different business model to how you might do a scale of product, which is doing screening for say, or not screening, but automatically detecting footway articles. The footway artifacts, you might go after um, local authorities to fund the work, for example. Screening for health loss or for eyesight loss or hearing aids, you might go after um, the health service. Or you, in either one of those, you could also obviously go after the individual. So we've done a lot of work, not just mapping individual uh, assistive technology spaces. So if you go in and look at these uh, topics, you'll be able to see where maybe you think AI could, could help. But we've also looked at the landscape of innovation across all of the products. And we looked at it across innovation for the whole of assistive technology, then looked specifically at products. How are products being innovated? How is the supply of these products being innovated? And, and how is the provision of those uh, products being innovated? And what we found is that across the literature and across the case studies globally, 
We did a global call for case studies with the World Health Organization, with UNICEF and with innovators and tech startups globally. We also did a systematic review of all the literature out there. And predominantly, people are innovating in products. And then when you try to go and look for evidence of that product scaling, you don't see it after about five years. And one of the reasons we believe that to be the case is because when we're developing products, we're not cognizant of how it's actually going to be supplied to the disabled person or the person with disability globally, or how that provision system actually works. So within the GDI hub, we're now working to try and make sure there are better connections between product innovators, whether it be with AI or robotics or any of the future technologies, as well as people who actually deliver the supply chains for those products and the, the financing and provision system, which might include the personnel to help provide the service. So we do a lot of this work through the disability innovation framework, um, and I'll quickly talk about this. The disability innovation framework is, is, has been set up to try and help innovators get over the valley of death for assistive technology. So we know that the valley of death for assistive technology, so the valley of death happens, you've had an idea, that's great, you go and validate your idea, you do research, you prove that your model works, that's brilliant, you write a research paper, excellent, it gets accepted, you get an award, you feel great, might have three award winning papers, brilliant. You develop the product, you get a little bit of money to spin it out, and all of a sudden you get stuck. It, how do you grow it? The product itself is normally very, very good, um, but you don't have a business model that will fit the AT sector. And that's where we're focusing a lot of our attention. So we do that, as I say, to this disability interactions framework, where if you look at this outer ring, it says that disability inclusion is a wicked problem. So if you're trying to get uh, disabled people in any community uh, to be fully integrated and, and fully able to live the lives they wish, it's going to be really difficult. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try, but it's going to be very difficult. And so you have to start looking at value and usefulness of your technology from an early, from an early point from right at the very beginning you need to understand not just what the value is to the user but what the value will be to the purchaser of that, of that device you want to try and make your innovation open and scalable it doesn't necessarily mean open source but but it means scalable to, to a wide audience and then you want to look at applied and, and basic research combined uh, which i'll go into now and then you look at co-created solutions so everything you've heard today has been about working with people with disabilities or disabled people to to work and, and to understand what they need. We, we did a recent review of a lot of papers uh, from for the neurodiverse community, and very few of the solutions that the computer scientists were discovering and creating didn't actually match what the society was asking for. So if you look at the research requests from the national and global autism and neurodiverse societies, we're, we're researching slightly different topics. And, and so th these things need to, to come better uh, together. And finally, looking at radically different interactions. The AI is one way in which we create something that's completely different. So we, we, we just completely do something in a, in, a, in, a very, in a very different way. So as I've said, wicked problems can seem impossible to solve. Um, the factors are difficult to define, they remain in flux and can be unmeasurable, but it, and they often go across different domains. So you might be working, for example, you heard a minute ago of people working in, in the education sector, but obviously, as, as you heard afterwards, people's education can, can impact their social well-being and, and other areas of their life in the same way as if your health deteriorates, it can impact on your employment, it can impact on your community engagement. And it's also linked to poverty. And as we all know, overcoming poverty is, is an incredibly complex uh, problem. When we look at applied and basic research, this ties in again to the next point, which is on co-created solutions. But when we're doing basic research, so when we're advancing the basic algorithms, for example, when we do that in tandem with applied research, what we find is that the applied research drives us to new research areas, which helps us push the boundaries of what's possible in the basic research. And then once you've pushed the boundaries of what's possible in the basic research, that sort of feeds back into more opportunities for more applied applications. And so if you work together in, in this team, and, and I think UCL does this very well, and the Centre for Artificial Intelligence does it very well, it can really begin to break down even these, these, these wicked problems. So I said uh, within the Disability Interactions Framework, we aim to co-create products and approaches in collaboration with both the people who will use the technology within given contexts and the people and systems who enable or prevent this use. 
So we go after the, the you know, for working in education, we're not just working with the school and the children and the families and the educators, we're looking at who purchases the equipment for the educators. And we're going after the policy makers right the way down the chain of governors in, into the schools and trying to get them all to understand the impact and the, and the value of the technology that we're dividing. So one thing that I think we don't often maybe look at is there's this great new um, manifesto out or since 2019 called the Crip Technoscience Manifesto. And I think it's worth a, a mention. And they come up with sort of four principles that they would like anybody developing technology or science to, to think about when you engage with disabled people. The first is centering the work of disabled people as knowers and makers. So really truly valuing that, that people who are disabled have the very best knowledge of what is needed and they are probably the best people to begin to make the solution. They might not have specific AI expertise but they, they definitely know the problem and they'll help you put the AI into the right into the right problem area. The second is committing to the idea of access as friction rather than pushing for inclusion or assimilation into ableist norms. And you've just heard uh, just in the last panel at how people on the neurodiverse um, who are neurodiverse or on the autism spectrum maybe are, are, are forced or we begin to make technologies that subtly try to put those that, that group of people in, into what we might think is, is more able-bodied. So surely people might want to be more normal, but maybe people don't want to be more normal. And actually, we should be developing technology that says, how can people that are not neurodiverse change their ways to engage with people who are neurodiverse? So third is abandoning ideas of independence. Independence, um, when none of us are independent, we are all interdependent on one another. I am interdependent on, on the conversations I'm having with you today and on the technology that's provided to me here. And we are all sort of entangled within one another when, when we, when we're within society. So this notion of independence is, is sometimes um, not constructive in, in developing technologies that are truly usable in context. And finally, committing to a driving principle of disability justice uh, that embraces the role of people with disabilities, not just as technology consumers, but as transformative agents and um, that technology that shape technology and the world in which technology is deployed. So building on that idea, if you, I think if you take that idea, you can begin to really think about what would radically different interactions look like. So how would we utilize the advantages and technologies to create brand new ways uh, for people with disabilities to interact with technology? And how would we develop technology to interact with people and, and across environments with the, enable, with the aim of enabling completely new experiences? Um, and so the, the final thing here is value and usefulness. So I've, I've mentioned this before, but just making sure that we understand the value to the user, uh, but also to the society more, more broadly. And open and scalable. So just to clarify, this doesn't mean open source. It doesn't mean giving away ideas for free, but it means understanding that each, if we're, if we're tackling a wicked problem, it needs lots of partners. So we might be able to say within a university, develop the, the basic research science, but we might need a company that's able to scale that provision. And that company might need to be working with an advocacy unit for people with disabilities or disabled people globally, so that people will get to understand the technology and, and wish to adopt it. And so we, we work openly together across the ecosystem. So building on that, and just keeping an eye on time, um, I'll move on to innovation uh, and AI. And so within the Valley of Death, we've begun to look at what are specific interventions we can make to try and help test what works in getting more assistive technology to scale, especially in low and middle income countries. So we've come up with the idea of GDI Hub Accelerate, and, and that is basically the innovation arm of, of GDI Hub. And, and what it does is it creates learnings, and I'm gonna talk about one of those learnings in a minute. It delivers system infrastructure tools. It connects innovators and entrepreneurs. They might be in large companies, or they might be a single person to world leading technical and research expertise based at UCL and with our partners, and it develops evidence for the disability inclusion investment case. And so one of those uh, you're going to hear from Bernard later. Uh, Bernard Shira is our, is our man in, in Kenya, and, and he's also the director of Innovate Now, which is Africa's first technology, assistive technology accelerator. And so GDI Hub helped to develop the toolkit and the curriculum that powered, um, that powered the, the accelerator. We worked with AMREF in Kenya to deliver the 
to, to deliver the, um, uh, the accelerator. And we've now gone through four acceleration cycles. Some of those have been fully online. Some of them have, have been uh, before COVID and, and in person. We've developed a live labs network um, and, and we've developed the curriculum and toolkit, which will be released open source uh, soon. So we had an open core. We had one that was specifically focused on mobile. We had one that was specifically focused on formal employment. And then we had an open call again at the end. And we have built partnerships. So we've, built, we've allowed the, the ventures to build partnerships to get access to our technical expertise, both in Kenya and, and, at, and at UCL, as well as globally. So connecting to the World Health Organization or UNICEF as they need. They get rapid feedback because these live labs allow them to go into where disabled people are, are accessing other services and, and test their device and get feedback on it. Um, and, and they're developing all of this in, in real world settings with our partners, Kilimanjaro Blind Trust. So one of these is using AI. There's a couple that are using AI, but one of them vis-a-vis uh, -vis, is looking at using AI and computer vision driven smartphone and web-based two-way real-time sign language translation service. So in Kenya, there's only a handful of uh, sign language interpreters for hundreds of thousands, uh, millions actually, of uh, deaf individuals. And so this is one way which AI can help leapfrog or begin to be in that radically different interaction to sign language interpretation. Um, they have begun to develop the, the AI and, and the uh, computer vision that they need just using off the shelf technology. And now what we're trying to do is help them build more advanced uh, algorithms and to test that those um, algorithms robustly in different, in different conditions. So when I said earlier that we also looked at uh, how do we build consensus or, or knowledge within the community, one thing that we did through the 802030 program was bring together a round table of experts on AI and AT. This was last year. And we produced a, 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 a policy note on this, but we looked at different areas. So one was communication. We talked about the examples of how AI can advance assistive technology like speech recognition and translation, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, but the, the, the opportunities and challenges within each of these areas, uh, so whether you're supporting users in, in more challenging situations, that's the opportunity, but there's huge challenges in terms of connectivity issues, human factors, just a lack of digital literacy, low awareness of, of assistive technology. People, I, one of the talks I gave earlier was talking about prosthetics uh, in a different, different hat that I was wearing. And we were talking about how in Uganda, many people didn't, un, didn't know that a prosthetic device was something that they, they could have. So, so we have these challenges. So if people don't even know that wheelchairs and, and prosthetic devices exist, how do we then explain AI powered communication aids? It, it, it can be quite a challenge. We also looked at mobility. Um, so you've heard already today about a good example of making cities more accessible to people with mobility impairments. Um, but we could also look at maybe gate prediction. So begin to look at some of the work we're just getting published now is looking at using wearables and, and machine learning to predict whether or not people have certain types of dementia. So rather and, and looking then later at how dementia might uh, deteriorate, how your condition might deteriorate. So rather than having to come back to Queen Square every six months for an update, it would be more personalized. You'd wear, we would know from your gait that, that your condition is deteriorating and you might need more help. And so you would, you would come in. And also information, a lot of people don't know that, um, about the, the opportunities uh, for assistive technology. Um, and so how do we get information to people um, more quickly? And one thing that we've done with the Joseph Stefan Institute and the International Research Center on Artificial Intelligence is to develop this AI and AT portal where it's any media article over the last three years and it's updated each day um, is pulled based on a taxonomy which is built via um, a machine learning algorithm. And so we, we feed it its initial taxonomy. It, it uses um, Wikipedia to, to build a, a much larger one. And then it goes and finds all of this information. And so people can stay up to date on, on things that they might not otherwise have known about. And we're beginning to now build this into a, an AT portal where we start to make sense of, of, the, of the media articles that are out there alongside the academic articles and, and feed that back to people. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, future tech. So this was sort of a catch-all bucket of stuff that came up from the round table where we didn't quite fit the other uh, uh, themes. And uh, so it went from everything from assistive social care robotics to autonomous vehicles, to diagnosis and monitoring and, and engagement uh, measuring. 
Um, and, and again, the major challenge there was an awareness of people understanding the power of artificial intelligence, not being scared of artificial intelligence, and also being able to um, understand that, that technology could overcome a, a disability. So all of this is written up in a, in a short policy note called Powering Exclusion, Inclusion, <laughs> Artificial Intelligence and Assistive uh, Technology. And I can't remember exactly what time I started. So if Felipe in the chat, you could just give me how many minutes I've got left. I'll know how quickly I need to go. Because the last one is an example, which is on euphonia. So um, just previous to um, just a minute ago, I talked about the different areas, which was um, communication and mobility, for example. And this is a great example of uh, communication, AI powered communication, which is being developed by Google, uh, by the motor and with the association, the Motor Neuron Disease Association. Um, I've put Richard Cave, who's one of my PhD students, uh, his PhD student here at UCL and at GDI Hub. And it's really his, his work, or he's the main contact for us to, with this project. So I'll just quickly go through, uh, just go through these, just give me one more minute. Um, so motor neuron disease, the problem is people living with motor neuron disease find it very difficult to communicate. Uh, so they can sometimes be unable to speak at all. Um, they can have negative experience of past communication interactions, which then affect their decision of whether to communicate later. Um, and so people really want something that will produce natural speech for them. Um, and also they, when they're speaking, sometimes they have long delays. So they need the technology to, to interact uh, for, those, for those long delays. And so euphonia has been developed to better understand people who have impaired speech. Um, and I'll just very quickly show you, you can sign up here um, and it's anybody can sign up and begin to give, uh, give voice banked data to the people with this um, motor neuron disease can give uh, about 315 phases are recorded and then the device will work for you. And here very quickly is the transcript. Let's get the headphones up so that you can actually hear. Second. Yeah. So hopefully you can see there that maybe you might have uh, struggled to understand uh, him, but um, but we were, but the the technology was able to understand. So the technology can help us who are, are maybe lacking in our hearing and cognitive ability to understand this person to understand better and therefore engage better in a conversation. Yeah, that, that. And um, with that, please do circulate uh, Euphonia to people because the more people we get, the, the better technology becomes. And I'll finish with a shameless plug, which is to say that we have a book out soon on disability interactions. Um, and if you're interested in it, um, please watch out for it. Thank you very much. And thank you to our funders. Happy to take some questions. Uh, there's one in the Q&A which says, I'm working in a creative hub of autistics and other neurodivergence to bring loved experiences to tech ideas. Uh, we want to take this further into others in an innovation network to ensure the community is reflected. Does this sort of network exist already or shall we develop one? Oh, right. Uh, this is this is a question, I guess, to everybody <laughs> rather than just to just to um, just to response to this. Uh, but that is in the chat from Mark Goblot. So if anyone wants to speak to him. Yeah, um, Mark, um, get in touch. And we we haven't quite launched our network out openly yet. We've been building it behind the scenes for a little while. So if you get in touch, we'll put you in touch with, with the right people. And, and when we launch, probably be early next year, you can be a part of that. <laughs>